I'm sure many of you will know um, uh, Dr. Anna Johnson. You've read um, All We Can Save. You'll have seen her multiple TED Talks. You've listened to her science on oceans. So can I have a massive, massive uh, welcome to Ayla. <laughs> I'm just going to let this go. I'm just going to let this go. I'm going to let this go. Um, uh, also, this is obviously, every word of this is precious, clearly. So if you can't hear us, shout at the back. I kind of suspect they're going to be able to hear us. But if you can't hear us, please shout at the back. So, um, oh, you know, there's so many things I want to start with. But what I've, with the privilege of being asked you a few questions, what I want to um, open with is I want to know about you. I want to know about you as a person. I find the solutionists, the people who work in this field, you want to know about me as a person. You should really ask Janisha, my chief <laughs> of staff. <laughs> like she'll give you get, the give, real. Give us the tea. I'm like, definitely going to give you like the nice version. Is of the nice version. So I want to. I want to think about. The, clearly, at some point, someone is going to make a movie of your life. You have had this wonderful, incredible of impact. What would be in the opening montage? What would be some of those? Who plays vignettes? me in this movie? Oh no, that. That, yeah. I, do, do you know what? Um, I, she probably hasn't been born yet, but she's clearly going no, to be feel young. Like, I feel like, <laughs> A, this movie should never, ever, ever be made. But if it's like, when I'm older, can it please be Tracy Ellis Ross? Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes, I do hereby designate the fact that that is who is going to play you. Absolutely. You. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, when she's playing you, and when uh, she's playing you as a younger woman starting out in your journey. Flashbacks. Flash, yeah, what are the flashbacks? What are the flashbacks that made you the woman that you are? Um, there's a bunch of answers, obviously. Um, but as far as like what's really visual, I think, you know, there's that moment when I first saw a coral reef and was like, holy shit. Um, I was in Key West, Florida with my family on a glass bottom boat and I was like, how come no one told me about this? How can this be my job somehow? And that was the spark for me. I think a lot of people have these moments where they fall in love with a species or an ecosystem or a place or a tree. Um, and that was mine. It was on a family vacation and um, that was the summer I learned to swim, so it felt very like um, friendly and, and like I was building a relationship with the sea. Um, but weirdly, like the scene that first came to mind when you asked that was when I was in a few years later, maybe like second grade, um, we were learning about the civil rights movement in class, just like, you know, the seven year old version of it. Um, and we did like a mock trial um, for like Martin Luther King was accused of what whatever. And I like sitting in my elementary school library um, and seeing the people in all the different chairs, like who is the judge, who is the lawyer, who is the defendant, like um, who's the jury, I thought, I want to be the lawyer that gets the next Martin Luther King out of jail. And I just remember being like, you don't get murdered, and you're super useful, and you get to be a dork, and you like wear fancy clothes. <laughs> um, and that's what comes to mind, this like deep sense of like, how do I help make things right in the world? And at the same time, thinking like, well, the things that I love are dying. And so how do I um, be part of that too? So I've had like tons of dream jobs over the years, um, park ranger, environmental lawyer, um, never politician. Um, I get asked that a lot lately, I'm like, nope. Um, and so I've basically figured out how to combine all my dream jobs into like whatever weird mashup portfolio life I'm living now. Thank you so very much for that. And just listening to you speak, it's almost like the origin story for environmental justice as well, right there with the environment, with the coral reef, and then the lawyer justice. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm imagining what you're seeing. I mean, it helps to have like boat. a Jamaican father yeah. and like an Irish, uh, like Newfoundland on one side, Jamaica on the other. Like I come from island fishing, coastal communities. I mean, m most of the world does. Um, and in the US, um, it's, you know, 
40% of Americans live in coastal counties. We forget that like we all have this proximity, if not this deep connection that we're really tapped into. It's like it's there waiting for us. I think so many of us remember the first time we realized the ocean was the ocean and not our bathtub and the scale of it. I mean, good luck getting out of the bathtub <laughs> yeah, as a kid yeah, too. I was, I was like, I live here. <laughs> 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 so here at Solutions House, um, we're really trying to think about answers, solutions, s really micro wonderful breakthroughs that people have got about sort of um, uh, transparent uh, uh, solar panels that can be glass through to macro ones about how do we change the, the entire story of where we're going with climate change. Um, and a lot of them we've already heard before and some of them are new. Is there any solution that you've come across, be, be it an idea, a technology, a mindset, a movement that is sort of really inspiring you right now or making you go, wow, I hadn't thought of that. Um, I'm really obsessed with seaweed. It's not surprising. Um, and this concept of regenerative farming in the ocean, like how we can farm seaweed and oysters and mussels and clams and scallops in a ways that actually absorb literally tons of carbon um, whether it's like the you know photosynthesis or these um, bivalves making their shells out of calcium carbonate, um, and how that can be a way to um, support biodiversity, create habitat, reduce local uh, ocean acidification, provide super low carbon footprint food that's incredibly nutritious, um, and create jobs in coastal communities. And I was like, well. It's like a quadruple win, if not more. Um, so we need to figure out how to do more of this. So one of the things that um, Urban Ocean Lab, the think tank that I co-founded, is working on is how do we help accelerate um, the adoption of these practices? How can we think about what is the policy structure that's needed to enable this? Because in a lot of places, it's not that growing seaweed is banned. It's that there's no way to get a permit. And so figuring out how to update um, the regulatory system is maybe not like the sexiest thing, but it's I, sexy. I love I a love policy it. memo. <laughs> Stay tuned, more to come. Um, and I'm on the board of this incredible organization called Green Wave, which is actually training thousands and thousands of ocean farmers and helping them um, get their start and find markets. So it's all about like creating an entirely new uh, sector of our food system um, and creating both the supply and the demand at the same time is is a little bit tricky but um, some very smart folks are working on it. I love that and when you think about the number of solutions coming from our oceans um, it's just just extraordinary. We had a previous speaker here who was like from, from the tech sector and it's like you know if I if I pitched a solution which sort of pulled carbon out of the atmosphere, that produced oxygen, that produced food, and um, that produced ledger, like people would be throwing money at me um, uh, if that was a tech solution. But here we have something which has had billions of years of shakedown trials. Now, um, one of the things which you've been talking a lot about this week is about ocean justice. Um, and actually, the organization Earth Justice is one of um, Futeva's clients, and we love working with them because of the geeky, dorky power of the, um, of the law to make a difference. It's just, just so, so central to how, how we're going to solve this issue. Get, can you tell me a little bit more about what, Earth, what ocean justice is and what you're hoping to achieve with it? So ocean justice is simply how do we put justice at the heart of ocean conservation and policy, right? There are people who live in coastal communities, who depend on ocean resources, whose culture and food security and livelihoods and safety depends on healthy ocean. So doing ocean policy without including that is skipping a pretty big part of how we get this right. Um, and so for the last year and a half, I've been working with an amazing collective of folks. Um, um, I was in the back before just like, posting on Instagram a picture of like my badass ocean justice crew if you want to see what these people look like. It's so important to work with extremely dope people. Um, and so it's uh, this group Taproot that started out of the Gulf South and is now a global black diaspora climate justice organization. Azul, uh, which organizes uh, the Latinx community across the US um, on ocean conservation. Um, and 
Center for American Progress, thank you, Judisha, um, which is a policy think tank out of DC and Urban Ocean Lab. And so the four of us organizations have been the steering committee leading an additional dozen um, nonprofits, um, indigenous, community, environmental justice, and national groups like Earth Justice in putting together a dorky policy platform to say, okay, this is our consensus definition of ocean justice. This is how you'll know if you get there. Have you achieved what this definition says? Um, principles for actually pursuing that um, around uh, equity, accountability, and inclusion. And then five planks to a policy platform, um, the priorities that this group has collectively come up with, which is really exciting because it's the first time that grassroots frontline organizations have been in a coalition with national ocean groups and been the ones who have more seats at the table and a louder voice by the design of the facilitation pro process. They always got to speak first, right? They always got the first draft um, and the last edit. So making sure that we replicate that in other sectors will be important, but um, this was inspired by um, a similar effort that was around climate justice. Um, but as is often the case, the ocean got left out, right? Like we have the Green New Deal, which has like one casual mention of the ocean on page 10 out of 12, right? We have um, our federal climate policy that's leaving out all of these ocean climate solutions. So it's been an honor to help like birth this out into the world. We launched it yesterday. So you can find details about that at oceanjusticeforum.info. Um, we don't have our own social media accounts, but all 18 organizations who are part of it are listed there and they're all doing incredible work. Um, and so the next step is obviously to make sure that policymakers know about this and are using this to guide not only their policymaking decisions, but how they implement existing policy. So for example, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there's $2.6 billion set aside for coastal restoration. But how are we spending that money? Who, I mean, it was supposed to be 10 billion, so like, but well, we'll take what we can get. We'll take it. Um, how are we implementing that? Who's deciding what that money goes to? How are communities allowed to have a voice in that? Who are we resourcing? Who are we listening to? Um, how are we caring about jobs and communities of color who are you know, being pummeled by climate change? So um, yeah, it's, it's just the start, but it's funny to say it's just the start because it's been like a year and a half of consensus building. Um, to get 18 organizations to agree on every word of like a six page document is no small feat, but, um, but it's, it's worth the effort every time. That's incredible work. Um, I'm just, you outlined it uh, so, so, so uh, completely, but there was one thing at the opening that always shocks me, which is people forgetting about the ocean. Like, it's right there. It's really fucking big. It's like, it's, it's, it's so much of our life. So many people, like, you know, I, I literally live, live on an island. It, it is so central to our lives, to our planet, to our biosphere, to our economies, to our sense of self. And yet, in this climate, uh, uh, piece, I, I hear people talk about trees all the time, but oceans. It, why do we have that blind spot? Do you have, like, a theory about why, it, why if it's mentioned at all it's often as a oh yes and oceans I only have like bad answers okay. that I've heard repeated over and over again and I'm like not actually sure whether they're true but there's this like out of sight out of mind thing but then again a lot of us live on the coast but I grew up in Brooklyn and I didn't think I lived in a coastal city because I didn't see the ocean and it wasn't friendly yeah. you know you're not going to go for a dip in the East River, necessarily. Is that a piece of advice? I don't live in New York. I mean, actually, <laughs> it is clean enough to swim in most days of the year, thanks to the Clean Water Act, which started regulating upstream pollution in 1970. So shout out to policy. Um, and you know, we have seahorses and whales and all sorts of cool stuff living in New York Harbor now. Um, so I think the question is, like, a weirdly hard one to answer because if you ask people if they like the ocean, people are very into the ocean. Like everyone loves a beach vacation, right? People would like for coral reefs to continue to existing and dolphins and whatever else. Um, but there's there's this like, maybe it's because we can't breathe underwater. I don't know. There we go. Um, uh, 
perhaps uh, if, we, if we wanted to think about it positively, we've been saving our biggest solution for last. It's like we've tried everything else, we've done everything we could, and now we've got to call in the big dog. I think there was also like a swashbuckling aspect to it that a lot of people couldn't relate to. Like a lot of people were inspired by Jacques Cousteau, but I don't think they felt like it was really for them necessarily. It inspired a whole generation of marine biologists, but they were like the wild west of marine science and conservation, right? And that's not like something you can necessarily see for yourself. Yeah. I'm a um, kind of wussy scuba diver. Uh, I, 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 I love to scuba dive, um, and I've only ever dived in the UK, which I can tell you is a little bit of a cold, dark. Uh, so I mean, so there's a reason I studied coral reefs. I'm yeah, like, oh, it's yeah. so warm. <laughs> I'm going to head to the coral reef. Um, I, wa I want to change track for a little bit because um, there's so many topics to cover with you. But one which I'm just feeling resonate throughout the movement of solutionists and change makers around the world is the TED talk that you did recently about finding the role that you can take um, uh, within climate change, which a lot of people are like, yes, I want to find my role. And then the fact that permission to enjoy it. So this is something which has made me cry watching your TED talk, has made a number of other people that I do, just so you know, people around the world are sobbing because of you. Um, I'm like, have joy in climate <laughs> action. And then they're like, oh, I can't. Exactly. exactly. So, so this, this uh, and you know, I've, I've, I've been working in this field now for almost 30 years of my life. And this idea that somehow because people are suffering, because these topics are so serious and urgent, um, that enjoying ourselves whilst we're trying to save the world, can, 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 people can really struggle with it. So um, how, how did it, was it just self-evident to you? Or did you have like a moment of, oh wow, yeah, this is fun. I mean, it depends who you're working with, right? And are you like playing to your strengths? And do you like being miserable? I think a lot of people actually do. Um, I'm not one of those people. And I think there's just such a big difference between taking climate change seriously and taking yourself too seriously. And like that's the part we need to avoid, right? Like, I get it. It's worse than we thought and faster than we thought and all of the scary stuff, right? And I do cry when I read the headlines. Um, and then I'm like, okay, as you said in your introduction, like how quickly can we pivot to solutions? Because me wallowing and becoming like paralyzed by the sort of like the horrors of the world, which are, it's, would be so easy to do. I mean, sometimes I'm like, I'm not going to look. Like it took me a week to look at the footage out of the flooding in Pakistan because I was just like, I can't take it right now. It'll be there when I'm ready. Um, and I think that's okay to like pace your intake of these things. As long as you're still devoting yourselves to solutions the whole way through, you don't need to like pummel yourself with the news because you know, you're doing your part. So I guess I hope that the tears that people were shedding watching that Good were tears. like yeah, the tears of like relief and like permission. permission. Yeah. And I'm just gonna stick with this for a little while because um, I'm not I, I hope you understand what a big resonance that is happening within our movement. And also the fact that there's some people who disagree with it and some people who actually feel that we need to just sort of sit in our grief for what's for what's happening and that somehow taking joy or talking about solutions, you know, might be in, in some way in conflict with the reality of the situation. I don't want to hang out with those people. <laughs> I mean, it, it's sort of like, it is natural to process your feelings, right? So it's not like every day I wake up and I'm like bouncing around the house being like, climate solutions, you know? I like, do. <laughs> like, sometimes I read like UN reports on the subway and I'm like crying in public, but in New York, like nobody cares, so it's fine. Um, but I think, you know, like there are days when I don't, when I'm not as productive. Like, of course we have our human cycles of like emotions and processing all this stuff. So... I am the last person to say, like, you must be happy all the time. And I don't actually subscribe to happiness being a goal of being alive. I think the goal is to be useful. But I think we can find joy in that, right? Like, how exciting is it to release a dorky ocean justice platform that you've worked really hard on? Like, I find joy in collaboration. And so I focus a lot on who I work with in addition to what I work on. Because if you're working with assholes, everything is miserable. And there are so many great people doing great work yeah. that you can just like 
Keep it moving. Keep it moving. Um, thank you so very much for that. And I know there's a lot of people who are going to take that sense of being able to enjoy it whilst you're doing it. And perhaps that might even make you better at it as well. Um, I want to come uh, uh, to uh, the rest of that TED Talk, which was around people finding uh, their role. And that wonderful um, Venn diagram. And I just love the fact when a Venn diagram creates like this emotional response. It's like, you know, there's not very many Venn diagrams that have sort of really kind of touched my heart. <laughs> of it. To be fair, there's been a few. But <laughs> I am a bit of a geek. But um, this idea of sort of very simply thinking about sort of what the world needs, um, what brings you joy, what you're good at, and, and finding your space. Um, I, I, everyone can obviously watch the TED Talk. but It just passed a million views. <gasps> And, like oh, I cried. Oh, <laughs> oh, million views. Love it. Yes. Um, by the way, at the end of this, with the people here and the people at home, we'll clearly push it over two million. Um, so, would you, would just just for not to not to go and watch the TED talk, obviously, but just sort of, how did you come up with that, and 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 have you got any examples for us of how other people might have used it? So, I think. So I get asked all the time, "What can I do to help? What can I do to help?" And I feel like I just kept having all these kind of crappy answers because what the climate movement has done for the last few decades is give everyone the same list of things, right? Everyone donate, everyone vote, everyone march, everyone spread the word. Um, and those things are great to do. I do that stuff. Um, but if we're not using our superpowers, then we're wasting our time, right? So, um, I think I'm trying to give examples that were not in the talk. Um, so one of them for me is the, the co-founding of Urban Ocean Lab, this policy think tank. I was like, I'm a marine biologist. I'm a Brooklyn native. Um, I am a policy dork. Um, the, so that is like, you know, sort of like the what I'm good at part. And then there's the circle of what is the work that needs doing and thinking about the future of coastal cities and um, just how unprepared we are for what's coming. And then in the joy um, part of things, I love cross-disciplinary collaborations. My co-founders are Marquise Stillwell, who runs a design firm called Openbox, and Jean Flemma, who worked as staff in Congress for two and a half decades. And the three of us, I feel like, are this weird like superpowers combined scenario where we're able to sort of like see and strategize in a really fun and they're just delightful um and so putting all of that together and i and i really find joy in changing the laws changing the rules of the game and so that to me was like the sweet spot of my venn diagram um, but there's lots of other you know i have others too that are more focused around the communications parts of the work that i do um but I think figuring out how people can actually find sort of a bespoke way to contribute um, is the most important thing. I absolutely love that. Um, uh, my mum used it, uh, just to be clear. So she's a, a retiree. I made my mum use it. <laughs> <laughs> and just, and just this, this fact that um, for so many people, it, you know, it's, oh, I have to have a, a, a degree in this. I have to have experience in this. I have to have a job in this. And actually just going, um, I'm not sure if you know of the craftivism movement, which is where people make, um, get people who don't want to go out there marching, sort of um, sew little messages and sort of very beautifully and post them off to, uh, decision makers so there's craft and care and love put into it which is something that she can do and this this idea of actually everybody being able to find this sweet spot where everybody can have a role in climate change I just think is absolutely breakthrough and I love that example because it's it's individual action that's part of pushing for systems level changes. Instead of obsessing over your individual zero wasteness or your individual carbon footprint, like which do reduce those things, please. But if all of us are just like freaking out because we one day a month used like a plastic water bottle and we were like in an airport and had no other options and then we're like, Obs obsessed with how we're imperfect like environmentalists and like crying on the internet about it like no <laughs> it's a huge waste of energy and so I love it when people find their ways to be part of solutions um, like their special way to contribute to the big solutions that we need not their like all consuming ways to focus on their own um, households or individual stuff because you only have so much energy and if you spend it all 
on that unless you are like really leading by example. I mean, there are some incredible people who are like showing whole new ways to live. Um, and I really should um, do more Instagram posts on my mother's composting because it is amazing. <laughs> oh, oh my, my sister, she grows all of her own food um, and she, she bottles it and But I bet it. she loves it. She absolutely loves it. Whereas yeah. I can't like boil an egg, so this would be not my way to contribute. I might have hard boiled eggs in my purse that are like from my mom's farms so that I can like <laughs> eat healthy snacks today. Yeah, and she loves raising chickens. That's her thing. So you talked uh, a bit there around the, your role in communications. And uh, we've got a big track here at Solutions House about storytelling and messaging and media. Because one of the things which we're concerned about is sort of like the understory, the meta-narrative of climate change at the moment is Frankenstein. Man makes monster, monster destroys man. And we have like a sort of narrative track I recently that. read that book. Have you never read Frankenstein before? Wild. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that's, that's what happens when a 16-year-old has to spend a weekend with Byron is you get Frankenstein. So uh, it is a wild, wild story, but it's such an analogy. And during like a cold age yeah. that was pushed by like a volcanic eruption that yeah. cooled the planet, which is what we're now trying to do with geoengineering, which is really creepy. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Geoengineering is a, is a separate topic. So what, what you, but, but, but one which I would love to talk to you about, it's like taking a cough suite when you're smoking too much. Um, but uh, uh, in, in, terms, in terms of the story, the Frankenstein story, the adventure story, the love story, kind of like, what, what is your story of, uh, what, what's, what's the message, the communications message, the way in which you try to draw people into this? Because I think a lot of folks are falling out of it, out of fear and fatalism. Um, my angle is, what if we get it right? Like, what if we actually just do all the solutions? Like, all of them together quickly. Like, what kind of world do we get? Like, show me that, right? Oh. So this is the book I'm supposedly writing. Uh -huh. um, is has this title, What If We Get It Right? Um, Visions of Climate Futurism. Because I feel like we haven't made a good enough case for the better version, right? Of course, like, we're not going to have this perfect, pristine world, but we have a lot of possible futures, and some of them are way better than others. Um, and so... I try to lean into this sense of possibility, like realistic possibility, not some like, um, you know, wishful thinking, because, you know, we can electrify everything. We can eliminate fossil fuels. We can change our supply chains and manufacturing. We can have green buildings. Like, we, we can have regenerative farming in the ocean and on land. Like, we can have electric transportation. It's just like, are we? <laughs> and how fast are we gonna do it? And like, who's gonna do what to make that happen? So I think it's really important um, for me and I think for a lot of people to remember that that's the game, right? It's like, who's doing what and how fast can we do it? Because like there is, there, there is a, a better version of the future than the one that we're currently heading towards. I, it literally gives me shivers, the idea of actually what if we get it right? What if we actually do this? And how rarely that gets talked about. And so a lot of us can't describe it. Like I'm having trouble writing this book because it's so rare that we get the chance or give ourselves the chance to really think about it. So as you described, we have all these like day after tomorrow, uninhabitable earth, fire and brimstone, Frankenstein stories. Um, and the closest thing we have to a what if we get it right is Black Panther. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is incredible and I would like to live in Wakanda yeah. for many reasons. Oh, but yeah. I think like we need a lot more stories like that. I, I actually love the fact that Afrofuturism is the now the leading image of a sustainable future. And actually... Which hopefully surprises no one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyone who's, who's read uh, Afrofuturism for years as I have um, knows how wonderful that is. In fact, actually, I'll share with you the Futera... Uh, uh, rewrote the SDGs for 2050, mm -hmm. imagining that we'd achieve the SDGs, what would we shoot for next? And we called them the awesome Anthropocene goals. And it was incredibly emotionally difficult mm -hmm. to let go of the current horror and inequities and challenges and give ourselves permission to think about this positive future. And the report has like 
14 pages of like disclaimers before we get to the good stuff of going, no, we know it's all really bad. We recognize that. We understand we're not betraying the people who are currently suffering, trying to think of a better world. And, and that experience just showed us how incredibly rare it is yeah. to give ourselves permission to go, what if we got it right? Yeah. So thank you so much for writing that book. <laughs> we're all waiting for it, you know? Like, why are you here? <laughs> You emailed me. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're incredibly grateful. We're and incredibly I was like, grateful. your TED talk is so good. I want to hang out with you in person. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, oh I'm gonna be a bit emotional. Um, so we've we've only got we've we've got a little a little um, while left. And you know, my next question was going to be, what are you looking forward to? But actually, you're about to write that story of what we're looking forward to. But in this change, in this massive transfer of if we get it right, this is a transfer of wealth, it's a transfer of technology, could it also be a transfer of power? One of the things which I'm really worried about is that the faces of the solutions look a lot like the faces of the problems. And what we might end up having is actually a transfer of massive power and wealth from one set of people who are very similar to the set of people who already had it. And we're not gonna get that kind of massive change probably for generations to come again like if we build the sustainable future this is the moment for bringing justice and equity into our systems um do you think we're, we're clearly none of us are doing enough but do you think there's ways which we can actually put environmental justice climate justice this transfer of power this transfer of leadership into more equitable models central to our conversation and perhaps slightly more central than the technology conversation, which at the moment it's all about tech fixes. Well, first of all, I know this is brash, but I'm gonna say I think I'm doing enough. And I think a lot of people are doing enough and a lot of people are doing basically nothing. <laughs> um, and so that's the question. It's like if we all do our part, we can get there. But right now, the pressure is on so few people who are dedicating 5,000% of their energy that they're burning out. And that's part of the reason that I try to emphasize joy because like I too am often on the verge of burnout because I'm like, where is everybody, you know? Um, and when you know how high the stakes are in terms of all of this inequity, it's like extremely um, poignant, right? So um, I think we have to like just acknowledge that like there is an enough, like enough is a level that exists um, and we should aim for whatever whatever that is. Um, and part of that has to do with like, what do we stop doing that's less important so that we can devote more energy to climate solutions. So um, I, I react that way because I'm just, I'm really worried about climate activists, activists, advocates, experts, policymakers, like feeling the intensity of this race against the clock and like looking around and being like, hello, <laughs> who's with me? Um, but this question of like, like potentially doubling down on or failing to rectify inequities as we address the climate crisis is certainly a real one. Like rich people want to stay rich. Um, powerful people want to stay powerful. Um, there are not really good incentives for shifting that. And so we're, and there are not good policies in place. So um, your mom's, you know, crafting project, like I think it, I think that, when something arrives in your mailbox that clearly took like a lot of time and care to make like that, like you could write the same thing in an email and it would have no effect. But if you receive like a needle point that says like, we need climate justice, that's a totally different thing, right? And people can tell. So I guess a lot of this I think is policy. Like we have to change the rules of the game because they're rigged. Um, but I think a lot of it is also like community level solutions, right? Like how are we making change in the places where we do have power, whether that's in our workplaces, the budgets for the places where we work, because you know, show me your budget, I'll show you your priorities is like a real thing. Um, in, our, in our household budgets, in our organization's budgets, how are we, um, how are we making decisions? Are we making decisions for people or with people? Um, and then how can we just like be courageous? A lot of corporations are extremely wussy. 
<laughs> yeah. Even when they have like pretty good climate goals, they like don't want to talk about it because they're afraid to be, you know, someone's going to say they're greenwashing or they're not done yet or they're scared to talk about process. They only want to talk about outcomes and like we all have to muddle through this together. And so we need some bravery on the part of the the rich and powerful, especially I would say corporations for um, for leading on this. Um, and as um, you know, the example of what it looks like to get it right that comes to mind to me is what Patagonia just did. Oh, wow. Which was wow. like, poof, right? And I got to see that from the inside because I'm on the board of directors. And when they shared this nude for me, I was like, holy shit, are you kidding? <laughs> We're doing what? Um, so I've been like, this is the hardest secret I've ever had to keep, right? I'm like, Patagonia's going to give away all their money to help save the planet. <laughs> You didn't. It. Shh, shh. <laughs> um, I told my mom because she like has no social media and like doesn't talk to anyone, like lives on a farm, and I just needed to get it out. Um, but I think the like, but you know, sort of like relying on altruism, yeah, um, is clearly not like the winning strategy. But when a founder of a currently three billion dollar company says we're giving it all away forever, which could be like $100 million a year, which would make Patagonia one of the largest funders of environment and climate solutions in the world, which is also pathetic. Um, the question is like, who's next? Now that we've like created this model, A, Patagonia is like doubling down on business fundamentals to make sure we can actually, um, you know, fund this in a meaningful way, but also um, making sure that we create opportunities for other people to follow our example and welcome them in. And I thought that the first reaction would be everyone being like, this is ridiculous, like capitalism is clearly the answer. I thought there would be all of this billionaire backlash because once one billionaire is like, no, really, I'm giving it all away. Talk about raising the bar, right? And like, who wants to go there? Um, but, but the two other billionaires I know, which is like... You know three I billionaires? Know three billion. Wow. Well, <laughs> well, now I only know two because <laughs> yeah. Yvonne gave it all yeah. away. He is so excited to be off the Forbes list. Um, they both reached out to me and were like, come to dinner, can we talk, how can we collaborate? And so I think... Who's next? Who's next? Um, corporations, individuals, like, can do this. It's easier, obviously, for a private, family-owned business, yeah. but... Um, there are a lot of ways in which corporations can like really step up, including just like not lobbying against climate policy yeah. and funding climate deniers with their PACs and using their platforms to shift culture. Yeah. Well, I think that um, uh, one, one of the wonderful things about the Patagonia story is it wasn't a billionaire donating his money. It was a capitalist company which will continue to operate as a trading business having a new shareholder, which is nature. And it, it, it reminds me, of course, that IKEA is owned by a foundation. So IKEA also is another very successful, very, um, very well-known business which has a foundation as its primary shareholder, as is the Guardian newspaper in the UK. I'm going, this might be, we're always looking for this sustainable capitalism and going, well, great, it's just a really demanding shareholder, climate change is. <laughs> it's like, that's shareholder value. So it's a fantastic, it's not the old, the old fashioned sort of Rockefeller donation uh, uh, thing, it's within capitalism. So this is in many ways my, my... Which is the problem, right? Because as it is now, corporations do harm and then philanthropists like do a little bit yeah. of good. And so yeah. I think Giving the back, first yeah. do less harm, like do less harm and do more good as a company. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, if you've got nature as your shareholder, that's, it's not about giving back. It's about, you know, you, you, the way in which you make it really matters. Now, this was in many ways my final question, which is what's giving you hope and enthusiasm and what are you really looking forward to and excited about? And, and that, that story is a fantastic one. Um, but we talked a bit about, about 
uh, burnout. So let's actually close out with that because this is climate week. Everyone's exhausted. Everyone's stressed. No one's getting enough sleep. We're all living off canapes. Um, uh, like we're, we're, we're everyone has hard <laughs> world eggs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, I totally get it. I also I love the fact we've t- spoken about our mums on this on this panel. Um, my mum is right now going to be making a needle point for you. I know that it literally the moment you said she needle doesn't point, she need to lobby me out. though. Like I'm in. She should send it <laughs> to like no, do whoever is crazy in England. Wait, uh, that's quite a long list right now. Um, so what? How do you survive burnout? What like what is what is your your way to take a breath out? I don't know, like normal human stuff. Um, baths, dance parties, dinner parties. Um, I spent the entire summer traveling in Europe and didn't tell the internet. Edit. Um, I was like, while we're all telecommuting, I'm going to do it from Provence. Um, and Northern Italy, and we all are Zooming, and you know, I would just do my Zooms after dinner instead of in the afternoon. So I think, um, and I sort of like worked half time, um, and I wasn't ready to write the book, so I didn't write the book. Um, but I have, as I mentioned to you, like I have slept in a different bed every night for the last week, and two of those beds were on airplanes. So that was the craziest travel week of my life, and I'm never doing that again. But if you're invited to like a party at the White House, the big Patagonia launch, yeah. and then you need to like go give a keynote in Maine all in the same week, and I'm sure there were like other things in there. Um, there's, you know, there's there's a time and a place for pushing, and then there's a time and a place for pulling back. And so, as long as we can sort of like ride the waves, waves. of that intensity, I think that's fine to have moments of your life that are like full throttle. But I'm not going to any climate events tonight. Yeah, you know, I like said no to like every other speaking event oh, know, so except good. the black people doing climate stuff today, which is going to be extremely fun. Yeah. Um, and so, like, that's the deal, yeah. right? Like, I don't actually need to network and make, like, more colleagues. I need to finish the projects that I'm doing, um, which feels rude to say. Not at but, all. But, like, I'm at max. I need to, like, deliver on my existing commitments. And so, you know, um, I'm already inspired. I already have, like, my marching orders and my teammates. And it's just a matter of, like, keeping it moving. Permission for joy and permission sometimes to stop. I love that. Thank you so very much. Can we please give Ayana such, such, um, there's a standing ovation going on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much.